the, the principles, the values, the collections of the great Union League of Philadelphia to share those values to as many Philadelphians, Pennsylvanians, and Americans as we possibly can. All that work is made possible through your generous contributions. All that we do uh, happens only through the voluntary contributions of Union League members and others that support our work and want to share our values. So I thank all of you for uh, contributing uh, and for uh, supporting us, especially over these last uh, year, this last year and a half. Um, so a few housekeeping items first. Of course, if you would silence your cell phones, that would be greatly appreciated. Tonight's program will include a Q&A portion. Um, I believe we're going to have our speaker will be moderating that himself. We will have microphones, I believe. Is that right, Kira? Great, so uh, it's important that you use the microphone because we are streaming live. So we want people to hear uh, those questions and we'll have staff that will, uh, Jim Mundy and, and Kira and maybe myself will be uh, walking around with the uh, microphones. Uh, a few upcoming programs I want you to be aware of. August 31st, we have a library hour that will be at Toursdale um, and it's on Benjamin Rush, Revolution, Madness and Benjamin Rush with Stephen Freed and that's at Toursdale. And then on Wednesday, September 22nd, we have another civil roundtable, and it is There Is No Fail Here, the real backstory to Lincoln's leadership challenges and his address at Gettysburg. On September 28th, we'll have the first of our Jack M. Templeton Liberty Series programs. We have a great series that we're just finishing up on. Hopefully, we can finalize that in the next month or so, but the first one will be with uh, General Jack Keane, same, some of you may know him. Um, and it's America must continue to lead. And finally, I want to make everyone aware of a special program that we're going to have on September 14th. Many of you have heard of, of a, one part of that program, which is the Frederick Douglass uh, portrait, which will be unveiled on September 14th as part of a celebration of the upcoming program season and the Constitution. Um, it is an by invitation only event. And invitations, I believe, were sent out via email earlier today. Um, if you have not received an invitation, I'm happy to let you know how you can get one, um, as is our uh, director of development, Kristen Moran, and uh, Kira, and our board member and development committee member, John Serlin. So just let us know if you haven't gotten one, you want to get one. Um, we look forward to seeing you on September uh, 14th. And finally, it's uh, my great privilege and honor to introduce my friend, um, who has been a member of the Legacy Foundation Board for since the beginning, I guess that's not that long ago, and the Abraham Lincoln Foundation Board. He's chair of our collections committee, has chaired our development committee, um, and he is going to introduce our speaker tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome John Serlin. Yes, John and I co-chair the Right Size Person Committee. Uh, <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. I'm very pleased to see all your happy, smiling, vaccinated faces. Um, so thank you all for coming today or tonight. Um, some months ago, I was asked to serve on a committee as a, a board member of Gettysburg Foundation to select our new president. And it's a major job. Uh, Gettysburg Foundation has a major museum and visitor center and uh, at least a half a dozen other major buildings in Gettysburg uh, had up to 110 employees and uh, does an awful lot of stuff. And we were looking for someone with a lot of skills. It wasn't a unidimensional job. It was a job requiring administration and fundraising. And it needed to be a real historian who really knew about history and loved history, which really means not somebody like me who reads books, but somebody who actually researches and writes those books. Uh, somebody who loves the Civil War and somebody who has a feeling for Gettysburg, a deep feeling for Gettysburg, and hopefully somebody <clears throat> who would connect to Adams County and Gettysburg and become a member of that community. And there were many more criteria, but it was a lot. And we had, uh, well over a hundred applicants, many of whom were extremely well qualified for the job. And we called them down, we met with a half a dozen of the best candidates. But what really happened was 
you know, I was like a basketball coach and Michael Jordan walked in the door when Wayne Motts walked in the door because Wayne Motts more than met every criteria that we had set uh, for this job. Wayne has lived in Adams County for 33 years. Wayne has been a licensed Gettysburg battlefield guide for 33 years. Wayne was the head of the Adams County Historical Society. Wayne ran the National Civil War Museum in Harrisburg. Wayne was the research consultant for painter Dale Gallen and many other wonderful things. In addition to that, Wayne had a unique thing because several of our board members knew Wayne and had worked with Wayne for decades. And they said, you got to have Wayne. Well, then we had our 100 plus employees and they came and met with some of our board members and said, you got to take Wayne. And then the, gar the guides came to us and said, well, if you got to get somebody, you got to get Wayne. So sure enough, we got Wayne. And I'm proud to say that I believe that Wayne Motts will move the Gettysburg Foundation to much greater things than we have already accomplished, which is really pretty good. So without further ado, I will introduce a dear fellow, Wayne Motts. Thank you very much. John. <laughs> Thank you, John. Appreciate it. Oh. oh, everyone, no pressure, right? No pressure. Thank you so much, John, for that wonderful, wonderful introduction. What Wayne was, was the two and three year old kid who was taken on the battlefield with a little cap and a flag who now gets to make a difference. That's what it means to me. I can't tell you, I have no greater honor than to be the present CEO of the Gettysburg Foundation and standing before you here at such an important place in American history, especially for the American Civil War, and to address and to speak to you this evening. So I'm greatly honored. I want to thank John for making the arrangements. I want to thank Kira. Joe, thank you. You're going to have to turn the mic down because I shout a lot uh, that's here. And thank you for coming this evening. And it's a topic that's near and dear to my heart which was related to Pickett's charge for July 3rd, 1863. And I'm actually going to talk about the charge. We'll deal with some high level stuff, but I really wanna tell some stories related to this attack. And because we're in Philadelphia and because we're wearing union blue here this evening, I'm gonna focus on mostly union stories here uh, for this evening. So there will be the Confederates, but we're gonna deal a lot with the repulse here for July 3rd, 1863 and tell you some stories. There's always two things uh, that concern me when I give a program, always two things. One, to whom do I dedicate it to? And number two, what stories am I gonna tell? Because those are the most important things to me. Every time I do a program, I usually make a dedication and we're not gonna have any exception here this evening. So for this evening, I want to dedicate this program to the memory of the soldiers and officers of the famed Philadelphia Brigade from right here. These are the four commanders of the four regiments of the Philadelphia Brigade, and three of those men, ladies and gentlemen, three of those men died in the Civil War. One of them, Colonel Dennis O'Kane of the 69th Pennsylvania Volunteer Infantry Regiment, right here, a tavern keeper from right here in Philadelphia, was shot in the head on July 3rd, mortally wounded. He died on July 4th, 1863. And two of these men are buried in Philadelphia, by the way. So this is a group of individuals at Pickett's Charge on July 3rd, 1863. We don't know exactly how many men from the Philadelphia Brigade were involved there, probably about a thousand. But this evening, it's gonna be a real tribute to them. John Riley of the 69th Pennsylvania said when the monument was dedicated, ladies and gentlemen, none could do more few did did as well. So it's just a real honor here to dedicate the program to the men who defended against that attack on the third day of the battle. Now, one of them is Richard Penn Smith right here. He's the colonel of the 71st Pennsylvania Volunteer Infantry Regiment in the Battle of Gettysburg. And in 1886, or 1887, excuse me, in 1887, this is what Colonel Richard Penn Smith said. So we're sorry, Richard Penn Smith. Wayne Motts is going to say something about the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, look what he said here. It seems that little of interest could be added. And everybody, that's in 1887. 
You know how many books have been written about the Battle of Gettysburg? Battle of Gettysburg has its own magazine. There's at least two podcasts related to the Battle of Gettysburg that I know of. And Lord knows how many books. So Richard Penn Smith, who fought in the Battle of Gettysburg with the Philadelphia Brigade, is probably thinking, what is Wayne Motts talking about here uh, for July 3rd, 1863? How many people here have been at the Battle of Gettysburg? Who's been here? Everybody, right? Raise your hand. Almost everybody. All right. Give you a little background for the third day. The Battle of Gettysburg lasts three days, right? July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, 1863. On the first day of the battle, the Confederates meet the Union forces north and west of town. They drive the Union Army right through town. They win a great victory. They push the Union Army right back to Cemetery Hill, Culp's Hill, Little Round Top, these high places. And on July 2nd, 1863, Robert E. Lee mounts attacks at the ends of these Union positions. And he makes gains at those places against the Union forces. He beats up a portion of the Union Army, but he doesn't win a decisive victory for July 2nd, 1863. That's why we have a July 3rd, 1863. And if you ask Wayne Motts, I'm going to tell you it is the decisive day in the Battle of Gettysburg. And the simple reason why it is, is because if you're Robert E. Lee, when you go to bed on the evening of July 2nd, you have an entire fresh division of Virginia troops under the command of a 38-year-old officer by the name of George Edward Pickett. And you can put Pickett anywhere you want on the battlefield. And you can use other troops that you have for any attack you want to make on the 3rd when Lee goes to bed on the 2nd. When Robert E. Lee goes to bed on the night of July 3rd, he has no fresh troops and he has no combat power left to make an attack on the Gettysburg battlefield. That's why day three is the decisive day in the battle and not day one or day two. It's because Lee has ability on the evening of the 2nd. And if you're George Gordon Mead, ladies and gentlemen, you know that. Now, George Gordon Mead, a name synonymous with Philadelphia, right? Got to bring that up today. Let's, whoops, let's make sure we're getting here. Uh, uh, yeah, we're in the Mead room. That's right. I can't, I can't get it, Joe. I don't know what's going on here. It's not, it's not helping here. Oh, there we go. Okay. So General Meade holds a council of war on the evening of July 2nd. And basically the decision there, which is a decision I think that's, pre, that's already pre-made, <laughs> is to stay and fight it out. And when that meeting breaks up, another name well-known to Philadelphia, Brigadier General John Gibbon, a man born in the suburbs of Philadelphia, who later went to North Carolina and was a graduate of West Point, says this, that when he left Meade's headquarters, this is what he writes later on, you've got to take that and understand, this was written long after the battle, but it says that General Meade says that if Lee strikes tomorrow, it will be in your front, meaning it will be in the center of the Union line because General Gibbon commands the second division of the second Union Army Corps, which is stationed at the center of the Union line for July 3rd. Now, Meade is prepared to receive an assault on the third day's battle. And these preparations were done, I think, very well. People have questioned whether or not they're done well. And how do we know that? Because the Union won. All right, let's, let's start there. This attack was repulsed. The Confederates lost. And Meade had an impressive, I think, an array of defense. Now, it's a lighter defense than at other parts of the Union line. Certainly, the ends of the Union line have been reinforced. There's a lot of troops there. But General Meade doesn't have just a token force in the center of the Union line for July 3rd. What does he have? Well, first of all, the Union has three principal divisions that will repulse the attack. They will be the divisions of the Second Union Army Corps and one division of the First Corps. So nine brigades, 35 organizations. I think it's about 6,000 Union defenders. So any way you add the numbers, the Confederates probably had 12,500 men in the attack for July 3rd in Pickett's Charge. Any way you look at these numbers, the Confederates outnumbered the Union Army two to one, but, but the Union Army had excellent position along Cemetery Ridge, and they had an impressive array of not only infantry, but artillery, 
which is going to really count here. And if you look down here at the bottom, and we're, we're uh, off part of the screen, but there were probably 106 pieces of artillery. And Henry Hunt, the chief of the Union artillery, says probably 80 of these were effective. And that's from a line, ladies and gentlemen, if you've been to Gettysburg, from Little Round Top at the southern end of the battlefield all the way over to Cemetery Hill, up where the National Cemetery is today. Huge line of artillery there. So the, the defense here, about 6,000 troops, right in the eye of the storm, right in the middle of this line, happenstance, right where the Confederates will make this penetration on July 3rd, 1863, is this group from Philadelphia, the famed Philadelphia Brigade. Four infantry regiments, almost all the men principally recruited from Philadelphia. Now, the 106th Pennsylvania also was recruited from two other counties in Pennsylvania, like Cumming and Bradford County, but many of its men and its commanding officer hail from Philadelphia here. And these regiments were originally credited to Senator Edward Baker from the state of Oregon for California. And then when Pennsylvania got recognized for quota, these troops were given Pennsylvania designations as well. So if you go to their monuments today, you will see where it says California Regiment also along with the Pennsylvanians. The total strength of these little regiments on July uh, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, 1863, was about 1,200 men. Now, they fought heavily on July 2nd in some cases, some of these units, so we don't know exactly how many men are standing there for July 3rd. So this defense is probably about 1,000 people for the center of the Union line, for the Philadelphia Brigade. The actual number present, we simply don't know. And only two companies of the 106 Pennsylvania is going to be present because some of that regiment is fighting elsewhere here. Once again, at the center of the Union line. About a week before the Battle of Gettysburg, the commanding officer of this brigade, who was a general from Philadelphia, his name was Joshua T. Owen, was placed under arrest, and a new commander is going to be given to the Philadelphia Brigade. And one of the reasons why this new commander is brought in there is to shore up discipline among these troops. So what you need to know is the commanding officer here for the biggest battle of the American Civil War just arrives <laughs> right before the Battle of Gettysburg. And nobody in these units knows who he is. Now, he is a very talented young officer. His name is General Alexander Stuart Webb. He's just 28 years old born in 1835 and a graduate of West Point, and he was an artillery inspector, and he gets promoted June 23rd, 1863, and assigned to command the Philadelphia Brigade, where he is wounded on July 3rd, where he gets the Medal of Honor, where he retires out of military service in 1870 and becomes the president of the City College of New York, and he is buried at the West Point Cemetery. doesn't die until 1911. Now, I have a single daughter. She is 34 years old, and I have never been able to get her interested in the Civil War. I have talked till I was blue in the face. My daughter loves animals, so I said, did you know that Alexander Stuart Webb, your factoid for tonight, was the first president in New York City of the Westminster Kennel Club? that showed dogs. Did you know that? That he and his half-brother were founders of the Westminster Kennel Club, and for the first 10 years of its organization, this man was president of that club. And here he is defending the center of the Union line on July 3rd, 1863. So General Meade has a council of war. There is a prepared defense in the center of the Union line after two heavy days of fighting for July 1st and 2nd, 1863. And now let's go over to see what Robert E. Lee is looking at. So what is Robert E. Lee facing? First of all, July 1's outright Confederate victory. July 2, Robert E. Lee mauls a portion of the Union line, but he doesn't get Little Round Top. He doesn't hold Cemetery Hill. He's going to get part of Culp's Hill. He's in position, but he doesn't have pieces of ground that he really wants here. So the condition of his army on the morning of July 3rd, he's lost casualties, but morale is extremely high for Pickett's charge. 
He's damaged the 3rd Union Army Corps on the second day of the battle. He almost destroyed completely the 1st Corps, the 11th Corps. Look at what damage has been done here. And he has fresh troops in a division of about 5,000 Virginians under the command of General George Pickett that we mentioned earlier here. His options are pretty simple. If you're Lee on the morning of July 3rd, you can either withdraw now, if you leave everybody a battlefield in the Civil War, guess what? You are the loser. You leave the battlefield, you're defined as the loser. So is, one, is A really a good option for Lee? It's not. It is an option, but it's not really a viable option for him. How about B? Can he defend? Can he wait? How far is he from his nearest supply base of operations? That would be Stanton, Virginia, about 150 miles from where Robert E. Lee is. He's up in a place where he cannot wait very long. And then number three, he could make an attack. And this is going to be a preferred option for Lee. I'm not sure Robert E. Lee ever, ever contemplated these other two options. Next to audacity in the dictionary, it should say Robert E. Lee. That should be a hyphen. If Lee could take the offensive, he's going to take the offensive. Why would you want to hand the initiative to the enemy? You just chewed him up for two days. So I don't think Lee ever contemplates not attacking. The only question in the mind is, what kind of attack? How do you attack on the third day at the Battle of Gettysburg? And why does he attack? This is what he says. Don't believe Wayne Mott's. Look at his words here. Encouraged by the successful issue. This is for July 1. Then on July 2nd, he says, partial successes determine me to continue the assault. And look what he says here. With increased support, the positions gained on the right would enable the artillery. Does anybody know what position on the Gettysburg battlefield that Robert E. Lee is talking about? Positions that he gained on the right. He didn't gain Little Round Top. Anybody know what it is? Peach Orchard, right here. You ever been up in the Peach Orchard area for the second day's battle? That is a high elevated platform. And Robert E. Lee really liked it because he could use that artillery to fire down where the Union troops are located. He also says, this is one of the most quoted things in his report, proper concert of action. Concert of action is what he talks about here. And he believes that this Peach Orchard area is going to give the artillery a distinct advantage here. So on July 3rd, what does he want to do? He says the general plan was unchanged. This is called Plan A. The Pickett's charge that you and I know of, Robert E. Lee does not come up with that until the morning of July 3rd. When he goes to bed on July 2nd, he has one plan. Then on the morning of July 3rd, that plan is going to change because the Union Army will attack. We'll talk a little bit about that here. He says that Longstreet, reinforced by Pickett's three brigades, was ordered to attack the next morning, and General Ewell was directed to assail the enemy's right. This is over near Culp's Hill. Lee wants concert of action. He wants these things to happen at the same time. There's a problem for Robert E. Lee, and that problem is that the Union Army is tired of having the Confederates over in their trenches over by Culp's Hill. So early in the morning of July 3rd, the Union Army, at about daybreak, will launch an attack against the Confederates while Pickett is still marching to get to the battlefield. So now we don't have coordination. Fighting is already going on over at Culp's Hill with General Ewell's troops, and Pickett hasn't shown up yet on the front. So now Lee has to go to what we call Plan B. So I try to remind everyone, Pickett's charge is not Robert E. Lee's preferred plan. It's not the plan that he wants to carry out. He has to go to plan B, which is Pickett's charge that you and I know, because he cannot get the concert of action that he wants, because the Union Army has attacked first here. Armstead Long, Lee's military secretary, says the decision here indicated was reached at a conference. This is to go from plan A to plan B. How did Lee make that decision and where? He made it in the Peach Orchard. In that area, it says within cannon shot of Round Top. All the planning for Pickett's Charge. I bet half the people, maybe a quarter of the people, know when you visit the Gettysburg Battlefield that the planning for Pickett's Charge was actually in the Peach Orchard for July 
1863. This is a view from the peach orchard right here. So you're looking down to the Trussell Farm, which is General Sickles' headquarters for July 2nd, the famed Copse of Trees, the target for Pickett's Charge, and of course, Cemetery Hill. You've got a clear line of sight here on the morning of July 3rd, 1863. Robert E. Lee will hear artillery going off at Culp's Hill very early in the morning on July 3rd, and he will ride from his headquarters along Seminary Ridge ride all the way down the line, go down to General Longstreet's headquarters at this end of the battlefield. And General Longstreet says he's making plans and Robert E. Lee and General Longstreet will ride together right out to this spot. And there are Union skirmishers out here. At one time, Robert E. Lee and Longstreet, are, you know, they stand away from each other. They're separated. There are aides around. This is not a small group of people here making this decision for July 3rd. When this breaks up, General Longstreet will get on his horse and he will ride back and meet Pickett's men and then show them where to get into position. And you've probably heard the famous exchange where Lee talks about, uh, I want to make a column assault. Longstreet said, how many men do you think it'll take? And General Lee says about 15,000. That's a number he pulls out of his head, about three Confederate divisions. Now, John said, Wayne's been a battlefield guy 33 years. One of my colleagues is sitting in the room here, and I can tell you every year I've been a guide, the number of Confederate troops estimated in Pickett's Charge has gone down. I, I, 20 years from now, it's going to be the number of people in this room is what, is what, is what, is what it's going to be. Every year it's going down. It's been 15,000, 13, 5, 12. We don't know how many men were in Pickett's Charge, at least for the Confederates. I think it's probably 12,500, as I talked about. Now, Lee's got a problem because the Union Army's got a lot of artillery, right, along this place. One of the places you got to worry about is Little Round Top. And General Longstreet actually tells Lee, what about Little Round Top up there? And Lee's military secretary, who's an artillerist, says, you know what? The artillery up here will take care of that place. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about it. Well, something to worry about, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> because the artillery is the reason why Pickett's Charge is going to fail. Robert E. Lee says Pickett's Charge fails because of the artillery that the Union Army brought to bear against this attack on July 3rd. These 80 guns that Henry Hunt talks specifically about. Now, why does Lee think the center of this line is weak? Why does he think that? He sees on the evening of July 2nd, 1,400 Georgia troops under the command of this man get right up at the center of the Union line before they are driven back they get a gain right up against where the Union position is. And Robert E. Lee sees this on the evening of the 2nd. So he's thinking to himself, hey, if 1,400 men did that, what do you think 15,000 troops could do? His number that he pulled out of his head here. He also understands that a frontal assault that is very vigorously pursued or carried out can overcome a very hefty defense. And he only has to look two days before at the attack on the seminary on July 1st, 1863. This is a place where Confederates came across the field, open field, just like Pickett's Charge. They attacked a Union position with a lot of artillery and infantry, and they drove the Union troops right off of that position. So if you're Lee, you don't have to go back and look a year or any other place. Two days ago, your troops just did something very similar to this attack. And if you walk this attack for Pickett's Charge, you ever walked it, the ground, the terrain there is very undulating. So you're not under fire the whole time. You're not walking an entire mile under artillery fire because you can get cover in where these pieces of ground are. So Lee is thinking about all of these things. This is what he comes up with. This is what he says in his official report and what Longstreet says in his Hill's artillery and part of Ewell's was ordered to open simultaneously. So there's an artillery a component of this. And the assaulting column to advance under the cover of the combined fire of the three. And batteries were directed to be pushed forward. Longstreet says basically the same thing. Directly against the enemy's main position. So we're not going to attack the ends of the Union line. We're going to attack the center. And guess what, folks? If you're George Pickett and you haven't been used in the Battle of Gettysburg and you're fresh, doesn't matter where Lee's going to attack on July 3rd. You're going to be in it. 
doesn't matter where it is. And the other you know, infantry units are going to be brought to bear here. The ones under Heath and Pender, these are units that fought on July 1 as well. That's why we don't know what the total number of these troops are. This is the position for General Hill's command. It's what it looks like, all the brigades. I would say that the lineup of the northern part of Pickett's Charge is probably about a half a mile long. And then the lineup of the southern part of Pickett's Charge, we call it Pickett's Charge because Pickett is uh, the spearhead of this assault, so to speak. He's the main person associated with it, but it had a lot of other troops in there, including these. So Pickett's about a half a mile and these troops that are on the northern end are about a half a mile. So if you're a Union soldier at Cemetery Ridge, when this attack comes at you, it's about a mile long. It's not one continuous line. There's little breaks in the line there, but it's about a, it's about a mile in length. The Union position, well, here's, here's, Pickett's, here's Pickett's commands. So you see all of Pickett's men. And then you also have reinforcements that are over here on the right of Pickett's line right here. So this is an impressive array of troops, but once again, George Gordon Meade isn't sleeping over there on Cemetery Ridge. We've got a good Union defense here. This is what it looks like today. So this is the Union line along Cemetery Ridge. Here's Hancock up there. What would a picture of Gettysburg be without a tour bus? You got to love it, right? <laughs> you try to get a picture without a bus. Run out early in the morning, get these. Here's the famed Cops of Trees, which is the target. For Pickett's Charge, the U.S. Regular Memorial, Lee's men are over here on the left, coming from the left of your screen to the right of your screen. I'm sure many of you have walked along where this line is. Now, I'll go up here where the, where the cops of trees are and look south. So here's the line. There's big round top, little round top right there. And now here's the Union defense going all along here. So there's a stone wall up near the center of the Union line where the Philadelphia Brigade will be positioned. And then the rest is uh, sort of like uh, what, what you and I would call an entrenchment of lines there. We're going to talk, let's talk about the troops that are further north first. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you some stories that are north, and then we're going to work our way back down here to the south to talk about the Philadelphia troops that are here. Now, I have two guests here uh, this evening with me, and one of those guests, relative, is Luke Emerson Bicknell, who was part of the Union Sharpshooter. So we've thrown this in for you, uh, Sally. So there is a group of Union Sharpshooters at the northern end of Pickett's Charge for July 3rd, 1863. Andrew Sharpshooters, Governor Andrew, John Andrew, uh, was the governor of Massachusetts. And this is a group of sharpshooters named in his honor. At the beginning of the war, they carried big target rifles. But by the time Battle of Gettysburg rolls around, they're actually carrying sharps and Merrill rifles, rifles that allow them to fire faster than most other troops in the Civil War. To load and fire a Civil War rifle, you've got to load and fire it about three times a minute. To fire a sharps rifle, you can fire it about nine times a minute because it's a breech loading rifle, which means you can put up a heck of a lot of volume of fire here uh, for July 3rd, 1863. Now, this man's born in October of 1839. He hasn't had his birthday yet, so he is 22 years old in the Battle of Gettysburg. And for 15 years, he worked in a clothing store. He wanted to go to Harvard University, and then the Civil War breaks out. How many people's plans get ruined because the Civil War broke out? And Bicknell is one of those people. He is in a militia unit for Massachusetts, then he joins the Andrew Sharpshooters, and he is badly, badly wounded in the hip at the Battle of Antietam. He's so badly wounded, he can't really march around with his troops at the Battle of Gettysburg. He's got a lot of difficulties even on the battlefield. He is a second lieutenant, and this group of sharpshooters in Pickett's Charge had only about 50 people. So we're talking about a real, real small uh, group of soldiers here. This is their monument today along... Hancock Avenue in the center of Pickett's Charge. Now, where the monument is, is not where they fought. See, that's why you need me here, giving the tour, right? Because <laughs> if it was, you wouldn't need me. Uh, that's here. This is um, uh, a really nice image of Andrew Sharpshooter's memorial at Gettysburg. It does have a target rifle. Some of the men certainly probably were armed with those, but uh, clearly most were not. And this is looking across to where Robert E. Lee's monument is, which is behind where the monument is, basically. On July 3rd, this is their position 
on the third day of the battle. There's the Virginia Memorial. And this would be the far right of the Union line for July 3rd, 1863. The cannonade will start at 1 p.m. on July 3rd that precedes Pickett's charge. There's a massive cannonade that Robert E. Lee wants to soften up that Union line. About 150 Confederate guns are going to shoot over here against the Union line. And then about 80 of these Union guns are going to be firing back. And for two hours, this is one of the largest cannonades in history. You could hear this thing in um, Baltimore as if it was a thunderstorm, ladies and gentlemen. That's how loud this was. And that's 52 miles from Gettysburg here. At 3 o'clock, the Confederates will launch this attack. And when they get out in the middle of this field, the first thing the Union Army does, they're firing artillery, but some of these troops actually come in up against the side of the Union line and fire right down the side from the Union line into the Confederate line. And that's exactly what these sharpshooters do and is what Lieutenant Bicknell does. This is a map of it today. So the end of the Confederate line is right over here. And if you look what I've circled here in red, where it says first mass sharpshooters, first MA right there. These troops go right up against the edge of the line on July 3rd and fire into the left of this. It forces the Confederates to actually move back and retreat here. At the same time that General Armstead and Pickett's men are attacking the center. All of this is going on at the same time. Now, Bicknell survives this action, but this wound that he received in Antietam was so bad for him that he will be discharged out of service right after the Battle of Gettysburg. He goes around to Illinois and a couple other places. He ends up settling in Massachusetts, and his health has, is, is not very good. He dies a relatively young man. I found this in a newspaper dated April 12, 1888, and it talks about uh, how he went south to try to recover his health. And it says that his wife and uh, and uh, oldest son had to meet him in New York and make stops to get to Massachusetts because his health was so bad. Now, I think what he's suffering from, they said it was in his larynx and other problems, but most of the medical description of what he's suffering from is actually tuberculosis, which kills a lot of people at the time of the Civil War. And this is his grave today in West Cunningham, uh, uh, Massachusetts. So he's, this is a soldier in Pickett's charge, and he dies. He's like 48 years old when he dies. So don't just think about those people that die on the battlefield. Think about what happens to people's health. You're out there campaigning everywhere in the Civil War. And I would bet money that he just didn't become a sick person in 1866. I bet money on that. His wound and, and everything else, that's going to cause problems here. On the right of this line, they're going to fire right into that and force the Confederates back. Now, right here at the center of the line, you have the famed Philadelphia Brigade. So let's move down from where Becknell is down here to the center. 69, 71, 72nd, 106 Pennsylvania, cops of trees against Lewis Armstead. Here is what the line looks like. You're standing, there's the 72nd Pennsylvania and the 69th of the men that are here from the Philadelphia Brigade. When Armstead's men come up there and make this assault, the 72nd Pennsylvania, ladies and gentlemen, is standing right about here, actually behind where I am in the camera right here. And the Confederates are right along where the stone walls. I mean, the action here is point blank range. And two of the men fighting there are officers in the 72nd. This is a photograph from a friend of mine of Captain Andrew Supley. He was an engraver here in Philadelphia. To my knowledge, this is an unpublished photograph of him. It comes out of a private collection. He commanded Company A of the 72nd Pennsylvania Volunteer Infantry Regiment. He'd been wounded badly at Fredericksburg. He's wounded in the shoulder. So even at Gettysburg, he's going to carry this wound just like Thicknell is. Except Suffley actually dies during the war. He dies right here on 12th Street in Philadelphia. And he dies on the 28th of July, 1864, after surviving Pickett's Charge, fighting against Armstead's troops there. And he is buried, guess what, in West Laurel Hill Cemetery. So these are all connections fighting Pickett's Charge to Philadelphia. This image is in the collection here. We have it in the database 
at the Gettysburg Foundation, and it is believed to be an image of Captain John Lockhart, who commanded Company C of the 72nd Pennsylvania. And guess what, ladies and gentlemen, where did he live and work? Right here in Philadelphia. He was a silversmith in Philadelphia. Civil War breaks out. He commands, just like his friend Supley, Company C of the 72nd Pennsylvania Volunteer Infantry Regiment. Now, one of the great things that the Gettysburg Foundation has is the collection of the Civil War Museum of Philadelphia. That was transferred to the Gettysburg Foundation and it is being held at the Gettysburg National Military Park. So the foundation where I'm president and CEO of, we are the caretakers of these sacred treasures, about 1500 artifacts. And one of them is this model 1850 foot officer sword that belonged to Captain Lockhart and I, I'm positive this is the one carried that he carried at Gettysburg. This is the sword that he would have had repulsing Pickett's charge. And it's actually engraved to him right down here. He dies when he is over 80 years of age and is buried here in uh, the Philadelphia area. Now, let's give you one of the last stories we've got here. Lewis Armstead. This is a Confederate story, and we're going to link it right here with Philadelphia. So while the 72nd Pennsylvania is shooting, the Confederates come over this wall at about four o'clock on July 3rd, 1863. General Lewis Armstead, 46 years old, born in Virginia, is the commanding officer of those troops and they penetrate the Union line and Armstead struck in the arm and the leg by rifle bullets. He's put onto a stretcher or blanket and carried off the battlefield. And a young officer, a staff officer to General Hancock, who is from Philadelphia later on after the war, this man, Henry Harrison Bingham, this is a photograph of him as a student in 1862. This is an unpublished photograph from the Adams County Historical Society. This man is riding down the line and he sees a Confederate general being carried off the battlefield. And he asked the, the stretcher bears, who is this? And they said, well, it's General Longstreet. They thought that they had General Longstreet. They actually had General Armstead, and Bingham says, put him down, and Captain Bingham starts to talk to him. And he basically says, look, I work for General Hancock, and General Armstead says, I'm an old and dear friend of his. So Captain Bingham takes from Armstead his watch, his pocketbook, his spur, his seal, a bunch of personal things, and then he rides to find out that General Hancock was wounded at about the same time as his Confederate friend. And he takes these belongings to General Hancock and hands them over to General Hancock at a field hospital site just south of Pickett's Charge. Today, Captain Bingham of General Hancock's staff meeting Armstead is commemorated in the Friend to Friend Masonic Memorial in the National Cemetery Annex. So here's Captain Bingham. Here's Lewis Armstead, and uh, you'll see the wound here in Armstead's arm right there, and he's handing over these personal belongings. Now, General Armstead last saw his friend Hancock, who is facing him in Pickett's Charge, in 1861 in Los Angeles, California. And Armstead will present Hancock with a new uniform. He will also give to Hancock a package of items. We don't know what was in those. And he tells General Hancock and Mrs. Hancock that if he is killed in the war, he wants these items sent to his family. Not only are those items sent to his family, but items that Captain Bingham takes from Armstead right here, his watch, his pocketbook, his bird and seal, all go at the close of the war to Armstead's sister who married a Union officer during the war. Armstead had five sisters. Three of them were living during the war and one of them married a Union officer. So he, this is actually in the life of Winfield Scott Hancock, and it says, these General Hancock sent to General Armstead's sister who married a Union officer at the close of the war, right? This is Armstead's sister, Cornelia Stanley Armstead Newton. How about that? It's a mouthful, isn't it? And this is her husband, Washington Irving Newton, and guess where they lived, ladies and gentlemen? Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. All these items went to Philadelphia. They went to Armstead's sister, the sister of a Confederate officer killed in Pickett's Charge, right here. And I stopped today, four or five hours ago, and took this picture. So 
Here it is, and they are buried in the Woodland Cemetery. That's, that's Armstead's sister right there, buried in Woodland Cemetery. No one has ever found these items. I would love someday to find out what happened to the personal belongings to Lewis Armstead. But they ended up, ladies and gentlemen, right here in Philadelphia. Armstead's mortally wounded. He dies on July 5th, 1863, and he is buried in Baltimore, Maryland. This assault, 12,500 men, defended by the Philadelphians. They lost 400 men, over 400 men defending it, will be repulsed on July 3rd, 1863. And the total casualties for the Confederates, over 8,000 men. Union Army will lose about 1,500 men on July 3rd. And as far as the Battle of Gettysburg is concerned, ladies and gentlemen, it's over on July 3rd. Lee will start his retreat on the evening of the 4th and the 5th. He will live to fight another day, and the Civil War will go on for two more years. But the Union was born in Philadelphia, but guess what? It was preserved at Gettysburg, ladies and gentlemen. No doubt, no doubt about that. We at the Gettysburg Foundation partner with the National Park Service to not only preserve Gettysburg and Eisenhower National Historic Site, everybody, but also to educate the public about their significance. If not us, who? If not when now? It's up to us to make sure that people understand what happened at the Battle of Gettysburg. I'm so honored to be in charge of a foundation that tells the legacy, just like this place, the history of who we are as a people. 12%, 12% of graduating seniors in this country right now today, 12% of them graduating are proficient or above proficiency in American history. Only 12%. It is the lowest tested standard of the nine standards tested in our nation's report card. Nothing comes close. Geography is at 20. That's the next lowest. U.S. history is at 12. And what are seniors doing? They're voting, ladies and gentlemen, right? They're going to be 18. We need to reverse that. We fight a war every day at the Gettysburg Foundation. It's not a civil war, but it's a war every day. So <laughs> anyway, I really appreciate your time and attention this evening. Thanks so much to the whole crew here. And I uh, went a little over. I apologize for that, but I'll try to take any questions. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you, Wayne. That was fantastic. Uh, yeah. Questions? You're all shell shocked. Yeah. Nobody wants that. <laughs> one, one last thing, because I usually do this and I'm, I'm out of practice in a live crowd. Um, questions? You guys all know how this goes. Questions should be two or three sentences. And if you can't put a question mark at the end of it, you have failed. <laughs> Good luck, sir. <laughs> Thank you. All right. John Serlin gave me the answer to this question, which was, Lee never wrote orders for him. My question is, it's inexplicable to me that Jeb Stewart, who had 5,000 men, was uninvolved in this. And he was running around the Northwest side. And uh, George Custer, with 500 men, kept him from being involved in the battle. What are your thoughts about that? All right, so the question being asked, is about coordination for this attack in the center of the Union line. Some authors and historians have uh, tried to theorize or talk about whether or not Jeb Stewart, who's the head of the Confederate cavalry, was sent around to the rear of the Union line to attack it while Pickett is attacking from the center from the other direction. There's no evidence, none, to support that conclusion. There are no orders from Lee that tell Jeb Stewart to do that. There's an order from Lee that basically says that he is to demonstrate in the rear of this, of, of this attack and to create havoc, basically. There is no coordinated effort, at least none that's understood. And how Stuart would have got that order, in my mind, uh, is not known either because a lot of this planning is going where he's already left to go over toward the east end of the attack. So uh, yes, Custer was there. Yes, Stuart is defeated. But it doesn't look like to me, based on any evidence, that he was sent around to attack the rear of the line at the same time Pickett was attacking to the front. Some people have um, said that, but there's no evidence really to support it. Yeah. Yes, right here. 
Yeah, hi there. Um, a question about the location of the monument to the 72nd Pennsylvania. Yeah. And I don't remember the specifics, but I recall reading something about a lawsuit about the, the actual location. Mm -hmm. I think it was of that monument. It was the 69th Pennsylvania that sort of held its ground. Mm -hmm. And was it the 72nd that actually gave ground and then later came back? Because I think there was a there was a lawsuit over the location of the of that reg, the, that uh, that monument right there, which frankly is a very profound and moving monument. Right. Uh, so the seventy second Pennsylvania was in position where the photograph was, where I was at, and ended up going going forward. But they weren't down there to that part of the line until later. There was an entire suit, like you said, it actually went up to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court to decide where that monument was going to be placed. This was before the Gettysburg National Military Park was created. It's when the Gettysburg had a memorial association that sort of managed the battlefield. And in that suit, the 72nd Pennsylvania won. They got to put their monument <laughs> down where it is. The position where I was at the camera is where they were, and then they push forward. And there's a great story about General Webb trying to get them to move forward. So General Webb comes over to the color bear, the 72nd Pennsylvania man named Finnessy, grabs a hold of the flag, and he tries to pull the color bear, move him forward. And of course, everybody in the 72nd PA around the colors why aren't they moving forward? They have no idea who General Webb is. Because if you remember, I just told you that he took command only about a week before the battle. So Webb finally gives up. He actually lets go of the color bear. He starts walking down toward the 69th PA and the color bear of the 72nd Pennsylvania is just riddled with bullets. He's killed in action, falls down in bullets. And then Webb is shot in the leg. They actually have a hard time getting them to go forward, but then a simultaneous surge they're going to move forward and go down there to where that stone wall is. So that's a long answer to your question, but it did go all the way up to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. And if you if you don't think a monument means something to the veterans or its position, it went all the way to the Supreme Court to decide <laughs> that decision. Real important stuff. What year was the lawsuit? The, What's the, that? What, what year did it go to the Pennsylvania? I think Supreme it's 1891. Eighteen eighty nine, somewhere around eighty nine. Is it ninety one? Yeah, my colleague will help me out here. If you forget these things, <laughs> Wayne, I, I have a question, an online question. Okay. Talk about Battery B, First Rhode Island Light Artillery. Now, I'm sure you know all about it because you're Wayne Motts. <laughs> sure. Yeah. And and I should say that this comes from one of our great volunteers, uh, Ron Woodman C. Woody, whose great great grandfather was a private who was a cannoneer in that battery. So Battery B, 1st Rhode Island Light Artillery, which is Brown's artillery battery, actually the gun in that battery was struck by an artillery shell. It hit the, it hit the outside barrel of the artillery piece. One of the gunners tried to load the artillery piece and get the ball in there, and the ball got stuck in there as the artillerist was trying to load it. Killed a number of the artillerymen around it. And that gun today is in the Rhode Island State House. For the 125th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg, that gun was taken out of the Rhode Island State House and brought right back to where Brown's battery was in position on July 3rd, 1863. I got to see it. I got to go under the ropes, put my hand in the bullet holes that are in the trail of that gun. And so that gun is still around in the Rhode Island State House with a ball stuck in it. Uh, from July 3rd, 1863. And they didn't realize until several years ago that this thing was loaded. This thing had a, had gunpowder in it. And, and, and really, it had to be diffused uh, in there while we're loading it. Yep. Yes, sir. I, I would be interested in uh, your commentary um, on Haskell's description of what happened at Gettysburg. I know that that description was written well after the battle, but did his work, in your opinion, have any, any extra facts or additional facts that played into Pickett's charge? So Frank Haskell was a staff officer in the Second Union Army Corps, and he wrote letters to his brother, very extensive letters. Yes, it's after the battle, but it's very near after the battle. So it's a very close primary source related to the Battle of Gettysburg. And what makes it so interesting is that, or so good, I think, is that Haskell's a graduate of Dartmouth College. He's college educated. So his letters are uh, 
very, very description. He says there were 18,000 men in Pickett's charge. That's what it looks like when you're standing over there and you look across there and go, wow, that's a, that's a lot of troops. And so I would highly recommend, you can buy reprints of Frank, uh, Frank A. Haskell's, Haskell's memoirs is what they usually, I think what they call it, or Haskell's letters. You can search online and get them. They've been edited. And unfortunately, Haskell was killed, I think, at Cold Harbor. He was killed in 1864. He was killed in action in the Civil War. I think we have time for one more uh, question. Jim, do you have one there? I'll tell you, not so much a question, but Wayne, would you please explain to the audience uh, the great Pickett's Charge web relic that we have hanging on a wall on the 15th Street stairwell? Yeah, I should I, sh I should have mentioned that. So I did have a clue that you had a flag here in the building because Jim, you did your a video. You did a video of this for the Union League, which was great. And I'm watching this video. And it's Alexander Stuart Webb's brigade flag. So it's the flag that General Webb carried in Pickett's charge. He didn't carry it. Flag bearer carried it. And these flags were identifications so that couriers riding around the battlefield could find out the Union Army had a flag identification system. Is that a general? Is it a brigade commander, division commander? Who is it? So when you're looking for General Webb, you're looking for this pendant blue flag with a white tree pole on it. And this would have been the flag that would have been uh, used to identify General Webb in Pickett's charge. And it's on the staircase where my hotel room is. So I came down the staircase and here's this flag. And I'm like, oh, wow. I mean, I'm just just speechless that there it is. So I got took photographs of it. It's one of the great objects here uh, in the Union League. So I'm a museum person. I love I love treasures. That's why I like working at a museum. These are the last vestiges of the Civil War. All of them with stories to tell about our history, your history, and all these things need to be preserved so we can continue to tell the story. Ladies and gentlemen, Wayne Shoot, Wayne Shoot, yeah. Wayne Motts. <laughs> Forgive me. <laughs> Thanks, John. Appreciate excellent, it. Excellent. Excellent. I hope it wasn't Wayne. too long. <laughs> Two other advertisements. So, uh, Wayne, you mentioned the Mondays with Monday, uh, and it, that that's the, that's what you're referring to with regard to the flag. Right. Jim, what is the next Monday Mondays with Monday going to be on? Jim, use your microphone. Anyway, all right, so uh, the next one will be aired on August the 9th. It was filmed in the banquet room on the second floor of the Broad Street Building. So we, we talk about the American Presidential Portrait Collection, but more importantly, we talk about why are they all Republican? And I'm going to leave it right there because you have to watch so, to find out. So, so please uh, go to our YouTube page, all the Mondays with Monday, this program, all of our programs over the last year and a half are on that YouTube page. Uh, we hope you'll visit that and um, and see those great programs. Uh, we'll see you up at Toursdale later this month and September 22nd for our next Civil War Roundtable uh, here at the Union League of Philadelphia. And one last comment I'll make, and Wayne is a great, I should say the Gettysburg Foundation, and now Wayne Motts is a great partner with uh, the Legacy Foundation. The three-dimensional items that you mentioned at Gettysburg, which are from the Civil War Museum, are great treasures. The three-dimensional items are there, and the two-dimensional items, the paper-based collections, are here. So we are truly partners in preserving this great uh, history. Much of it is Gettysburg. So thank you again, Wayne. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. <laughs>